Have you played Hi-Fi Rush and thought, I'd like to make a rhythm action game in Unity, only to find out it's not as easy as you expected? Did you go down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out why your music keeps going out of sync and get nowhere? The solution to this problem is both easier and harder than you might think. Honestly, it depends how hard you think it is. So in theory, syncing your game to a beat should be easy. You take the BPM, or beats per minute, of your track, work out how long that beat is in seconds, and then trigger at that interval. Simples. The problem with this method is that your music and your game are working independently of each other. If the audio source is slightly delayed in starting, or the music stutters, or the game itself somehow gets out of sorts, your game and your music go out of sync and there is absolutely no way to correct it other than restarting both systems, because they're not talking to each other. This should be easy to get around. Instead of using the game time to track our beat, we use the elapsed time of the audio we're playing. That way, no matter what happens with the game or the audio source, our beat will always be in sync with the audio. Simples. This method works fine for uncompressed audio, but the way compressed audio is handled in Unity means that the time value is essentially useless for syncing if the track is like an MP3 or something like that. So, how do we do it? To get around this issue, we do something that, to be honest, Unity should probably offer itself. Audio Source gives us a time samples variable, which tells us how many samples we are into the audio track. It's kind of like a time thing, only instead of seconds, we're counting samples. By dividing this number by the frequency of the audio clip, we get an accurate elapsed time, regardless of whether it's compressed or not. Well, accurate enough for this anyway. Since the frequency represents a whole second of audio, we can get different intervals by altering this value. For example, if we calculate our BPM as a fraction of a second, and then multiply the frequency by it, we get our time elapsed in beats, rather than seconds. As an example, to find out the length of our beat in seconds from a 120 BPM track, we divide 60 by 120. That gives 0.5 seconds, which is the length of our beat. Let's say our frequency is 44.1 kilohertz. We multiply that 44.1 kilohertz, 44.1000, by our beat length of 0.5, and we get 22,050. Finally, we divide our time samples by that value, and then check the result to see if it's a whole number. If it is a whole number, we've reached a new beat, and we are now measuring our track in beats rather than seconds. So, hopefully that all makes sense. Let's actually make it work. So as you can see in my scene here, I've got three cubes, nothing special, and I've put a script on each of these cubes, and all it does is it causes the cube to pulse. So it just gets larger, and then it gradually goes back down to the same size. I've implemented a little IE enumerator to just do a test beat. So this every second, this will pulse if I check this box, use test beat. So we'll just show you what that looks like now. So that's all this is going to do. What we're going to do in this video is get this to do that in time with the music. I'm just going to create an empty and we'll call this beat controller and we're just going to add an audio source to it and then I created a little drum loop that I'm just going to drag in and this is 120 beats per minute and the reason 120 beats per minute is relevant is because if you remember we are dividing 60 seconds by our BPM which gives us essentially a round number I mean it's not it's 0 0.5 but like when you're talking in seconds so you're getting two beats per second it evens out so if I press play now with this loop running it's going to look like it's in time except it's not in time it's just it just looks like it's in time because we started it at the same time so what we want to be able to do is track where we are in our elapsed time of our audio track and then we want to hit the beats according to the bpm of that track so let's go into our scripts folder we're going to create a new script which i'm just going to call beat manager i guess I'm going to drag that onto our beat controller. I could have called it beat controller, really, couldn't I? So in our beat manager script, we're going to need a few variables that we need to work with. So we're going to serialize field them and make them private because we don't need to access them from anywhere else except for the inspector. So first one is just going to be BPM, self-explanatory. And then we want our audio source. And I'm going to make this rather than, I'm not going to get the component because you might not have your audio source on the same object as this script. And then finally, we're going to need an array, and we're going to call this an array of intervals. Now, we haven't got a class for this yet. We're going to make that next. But for now, let's just make the uh, declaration. And then if we go down below our class, and we're going to make a new class called public class intervals. 
And this wants to be a system.serializable class because we're going to need to set some of these variables in the inspector. Once again, serialize field private because we don't need to access this one from outside. And it's just going to be a float. And I'm going to call it steps. Now, if anyone is like a proper musician in the comments, feel free to let me know what I should have called this variable. Hopefully it will be clear what this variable does. But I, yeah, I couldn't figure out what to call it. And our next variable is going to be a private because once again, we don't need to access it from outside this script. Unity event, and it's going to be called trigger. And we're getting an error there because we haven't got the event system. So if we just go up to the top here, using unity engine dot events, and we only need one private there. So the first thing we need is a public function. And that public function is going to be a float. And we're going to call it get interval length. And it's going to take in a BPM which is quite literally the BPM of the track that we are working with. And it's going to return 60, which is seconds. So 60 seconds because it's beats per minute. So if you think about it as beats per minute tells us how many beats are in a minute, 60 divided by BPM tells us how many seconds there are in a beat. And it's divided by BPM multiplied by steps. So if we were to just divide it by BPM, we would get how many beats there are every second. Modifying it with the steps value means that now we can tell if the steps value is 0 0.5, we're getting half as many beats. If it's two, we're getting twice as many beats. It just allows us to modify it so we can have different intervals. We can have a quarter beat, we can have a half beat, we can have a full beat. Now we need to use this variable. And to do that, we're gonna have a public void check for new interval. And that's gonna take in a float interval. And then in here, we want to say if mathf dot floor to int interval does not equal oh right sorry there is one more variable i didn't add private we don't need to make this one serializable this one's purely for inside the class int last interval we need to keep track of what the last interval was the last time we called this function so if it does not equal last interval then the first thing we want to do is set last interval to equal mathf dot floor to int interval. So the reason that we are doing floor to int, basically we want to check every whole number. So every time this number that we're about to pass into here crosses over to a, n a new whole number, that means we have passed a new beat. We've passed that interval one more time. You could check if it's a whole number by doing something like, um, I'm not 100% sure this is right, but like if interval percentage sign one is equal to zero, I think that would return false if there was anything after the decimal point. But the problem is we're working with floating points and frame rates. So if you imagine a second at any given time, maybe something like five point zero 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 four three nine four or five, that's not going to return true as a whole number. And because we're working in frame rates, we can't guarantee that we're ever going to get a whole number because frame rates are like 0 0.02 seconds, 0 0.014 seconds, etc. We can't guarantee that we're ever going to hit an actual whole number. So instead, what we do is we floor to int. So we round it down to the nearest number and it has to be down, not just round, it has to round down. And then we keep track of that number. So then, because we're updating so regularly, when we check the next one, if that number has changed, that means we've moved up one. And because we're doing this, as soon as we notice that it's changed, it's close enough that it, it works. Now, it, technically speaking, you may be 0 0.00048 seconds or something after the beat, but it's far too small of a distance for any human to notice, any normal human. So once we've checked that, the next thing we want to do is say, trigger.invoke. The reason we're using event triggers is so that we can easily drag other stuff into the inspector to be triggered by this, this beat script. Speaking of the beat script, we need to actually make the beat script do something. So private void update. And then all we're going to do is for each interval, interval in intervals. And then we want to get our sampled time. So our sampled time is going to equal audio source dot time samples divided by audio source dot clip dot frequency. So that's the frequency of the clip multiplied by the interval dot get beat length. 
Remember, each one of these intervals here that we're going to set up in the inspector is going to have a different beat length. So there's going to be a full beat length, a half beat length, a quarter beat length. So this is looping through each of them and determining whether we are currently on that beat. So BPM, we're passing in the BPM. Uh, and this isn't get beat length, this is get interval length. I should have called it beat. There's no going back now. So that gets us our sampled time. And then all we need to do from there is say interval dot check for new interval and we just pass in sampled time. So to recap, this gets us the, the interval, the length of our current beat that we're trying to track. This gets us the time that we are currently elapsed divided by the number of those intervals. So essentially it gets us the time elapsed in intervals, in beats. And then this sends that number over to this function where it checks to see if we have actually crossed a new beat or not. So let's give that a try. So for our BPM, I'm gonna set it to 120. We're gonna to have to add our audio source in there. And then for our intervals, I'm gonna set up three intervals. The first one is gonna be a whole step. So that's one every beat. And I'm gonna drag in the little cube for this one. So I believe that is the green one. Yeah, so we'll drag in the little cube for that one. And now we can see in our function drop down, we've got pulse to beat and we've got pulse. So that is the function that I created to actually make the, all this does is it every update, it lerps down from whatever size it is to the start size, whatever size it started as. Obviously, if it's already at the start size, that means it doesn't do anything. When we call the pulse function, it sets the size of the object to a different size, which then causes it to start lerping back down to the same size. So we get an instant increase in size followed by a gradual decrease in size. Then our second beat is going to be 0 0.5 so this is every two beats essentially so this one is going to hit every single beat this one is going to hit every two beats i'm going to pass in the red cube again select the function and then finally this one is going to be 0 0.25 so this one is going to hit every four beats so let's give that a try perfect and just to show you that it does work, we'll drag in our 93 beats per minute. And if we drop down to here and change this to 93 beats per minute, it should still work. Now, a couple of things to note about this script. This is to sync your game to a beat, not to a track. So if you want things to hit, like say in time with a particular instrument or a particular part of the beat, this isn't that. If you wanted to time like events to correspond to certain things in a song, you might want to look at something like Choreographer or bringing in MIDI tracks, for example. And then the final thing to note is that you do need to know the BPM of the track you're putting in. But as I was saying, this is just on the beat. It, it doesn't know what is going on in that music track. It is just triggering to time every beat every two beats and every four beats. Another important thing to remember about these variables here is that they are also linked to your time signature in that I'm currently using a four by four beat. So that means that as long as my numbers are increments of a quarter, essentially, so 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, as long as they hit those quarters, it will match my four by four beat. If you're using some kind of weird beat, like six, eight or three, four or something like that, you're gonna have to work out the variables. So that I believe three, four, you'd need something like 0.33, possibly. If you're working with a beat that's not four, four, you probably know more about this than I do anyway. Now, last thing, let's see this working in a proper scene. <laughs> is everything. To make things work, you just drag something onto a script that you can trigger, and then you drop it into the Unity events thing in the inspector of your beat controller, of your interval controller, your beat manager, whatever you call it, and then you just say it to trigger the function. As you can see in this demo, I also have it triggering some lights to come on and off. So that's it. All that's left to do is to thank my amazing patrons. All of my patrons are amazing and deserve all the thanks, as do the Twitch subscribers, the Discord, Nitro boosters, and anyone else 
to support in any way anyone has bought anything from teespring i love you all you're all amazing and i appreciate you greatly but the special thanks go to the sugar daddy slash mama tier supporters who are gabriel white dave maldine rich reed aaron clark mr drunken dragon and inanya and also i'd like to give a special little shout out to irregularity for contributing a bunch of prizes to beaks jam 2023 so that's all for now i hope you found this video useful and i'll see you next time bye bye